The Night Beat starts right now. Tonight we begin with new information on the migrants found trapped in a train car near Uvalde. Out of the 17 found, there were 15 men and two women. This is according to Homeland Security Investigations, which is now handling the case. Two of the men were pronounced dead at the scene and four others were taken to area hospitals for treatment. The migrants were discovered Friday evening just before 4 p.m. This was after an emergency dispatch received a call about several people trapped and suffocating inside a train east of Kanipa. Two men were airlifted to University Hospital, both in critical condition tonight. Krista Santa Rosa Hospital at Westover Hills has one patient and Methodist Hospital has two. Three migrants are right now in Border Patrol custody. And today marks one year since the Das Goat fire broke out in Medina County. Over 1,000 acres burned, including three homes. As the night team's Lee Waldman reports, the fire department that covers that region is working to be more prepared should the worst happen again. Um, and this is a ATV that is, you know, mocked up to be a fire truck and also a rescue vehicle. This vehicle can get where fire trucks cannot. Through the thick brush in the rural land across Medina County, it was a donation from a community grateful to their fire department. That's a fire that's going to affect this community for a long time. Last year, a car sparked the Dascoat fire that burned for eight days. Three homes were destroyed in the High Mountain Ranch subdivision. 1,092 acres still left in ashes. We still hadn't received a whole lot of rain, and so, you know, seeing this as a visual reminder that we still face a major risk in this area for wildfires. Chief Cook took us to Medina Lake. The water level shows just how dry things are. One thing working in their favor. They're fully stocked, fully equipped. There's a New full-time firefighters like Lieutenant Ramon Martinez. Now that we're here, you know, we can help, you know, continue to build so that maybe we don't have that kind of fire, that big of a fire in the future. This is our fire dorm. Two fire stations in the area are now staffed with a minimum of four people 24-7. Since the Dascoat fire, the volunteer firefighter base has also increased by 40 people. We cover 250 square miles, and so right now we're doing it out of four stations. Two of them are fully staffed, and uh, but it, it just takes a little bit longer to get there. We got hoses here. Cook is confident the full-time firefighters can cut down on that time, but he says they need the community to help as well. With conditions similar to last year at this time, the wildfire risk is still high. You know, burning any outdoor fires, it, it's a risk right now. And if you see anything, report it quick. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. A Bear County Sheriff's Office sergeant is facing possible termination after he was arrested for DWI while off duty. 37-year-old Juan Medrano is charged with a DWI, a Class B misdemeanor, after being pulled over this morning. It happened just after midnight at Babcock Road and Loop 410. BCSO officials say Medrano has been with them for 15 years and is currently assigned to the Detention Bureau. He sits in the Bear County Jail with a bond of $1,200. A San Antonio family feeling one step closer to peace after the man was after a man was charged for the death of their daughter, who was last seen nearly four years ago. A vigil was held in Poteet for Tiffany Garza. Her remains were found in a burn pit behind a home in Atascosa County. It took researchers at least two universities to analyze the remains, which also included DNA of a suspect. Last week, a man was arrested. Tiffany's mother spoke with us and says she's grieving two losses now, but she's on the path to healing. My pain would never leave me because that was my only daughter. And my son just passed away six months ago, you know, and his heart was so broken knowing that we weren't even getting justice. But I'm here to tell them too, that I never gave up on them. And you know, now we're gonna get our closure and we are gonna be at ease and we're Moving on, well, the man arrested is being held at Atascosa County Jail on a $500,000 bond. New information tonight. We now know the name of the 80-year-old who died in his home from a fire this week. He's identified as Alfred Marsh. That's according to the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. The fire happened Tuesday morning at his home on West Summit Avenue, not far from I-10 and Blanco Road. Fire officials say a space heater on the first floor caused the fire. Marsh's wife was on the first floor and was able to escape. When firefighters got to the scene, the flames were too intense for crews to rescue him upstairs. 
Repairs are underway on a broken water main on North St. Mary Street. The break happened around 6 this afternoon near East Woodlawn Avenue. It impacted local restaurant Tycoon Flats. Fortunately, Saw's crews were able to reduce the water pressure instead of cutting the water off entirely so the business could stay open. District 1 Councilman Mario Bravo says the break had nothing to do with construction. Instead, old infrastructure is to blame. And back in December, we talked to you about an after-school art nonprofit, SACI, trying to unionize. SACI union members say it's been a multi-month uphill battle, but now they're officially unionized. The night team's Camilla Wada shares what workers are demanding. SACI staff reached out to board members in October to begin unionizing. They were surprised the board did not accept the union voluntarily. Instead, hired a law firm they say is known for working against unions. We don't have the capacity to be that aggressive. I don't have $50,000 to throw at a law firm to, to represent. After going through a multi-month process with the National Labor Relations Board, the SACI union is official. I don't want SACI to ever be perceived as a place that takes advantage of the love and loyalty of its students when they become workers. Union members are now developing a workers contract to present to the board sometime next month. We have money to do arts programming that is second to none in the United States, but we don't have money to pay the workers to have it done. Workers compensation is one issue being brought up. Another is workers would like to be involved in future programming that the board proposes. In order to create healthy programming, you need to know the perspective of the people in the trenches. They see board members say in a statement, the board of directors are glad the NLRB made their determination and we fully support their decision regarding those eligible for the union. After school programming has not been impacted by the unionizing process. Camila Juarez, Quesa 12 News. Thank you, Camilla. Well, the 27th annual Cesar y Chavez March for Justice had no issues as thousands showed up to participate. The march happened in the historical Avenida Guadalupe neighborhood outside of the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. The goal of the march is to offer people an opportunity to discuss different perspectives on important issues and developments happening in our city. This year's Grand Marshal was the Castro family, which includes Councilwoman Rosie Castro and her two sons, Congressman Joaquin Castro and former Housing and Urban Development Secretary Julian Castro. And the good news as well for that earlier today is that the weather was fantastic outside. Look outside with live cam this Saturday night. We're pretty quiet here in and around San Antonio. Still do have that drier air in place. That combined with the sunshine that we saw today helped temperatures climb into the 80s. But it did feel pretty comfortable out there because of those lower humidity values. Now, right now we're seeing those thermometers fall into the 60s. Still dry air in place, which means as we head into the overnight, hours. Temperatures should be able to bottom out in the mid 50s here in town by wake up time tomorrow. But here's the thing that drier air in place right now. That's not going to last too much longer. In fact, throughout the day, we are expecting those dew points to rise. So maybe a little bit more low level cloud cover, especially by the late morning hours for our Sunday. But I do think we will find a bit more sunshine into the afternoon. Once again, helping those temperatures climb into the low to mid 80s. Now, as we head into next week additional changes when it comes to temperatures and daily isolated chances for rain. We'll time all that out and get you the details coming up in just a few. Definitely looking forward to those rain chances. Thanks, Mia. Around Texas today, gun violence prevention advocates rallied in Austin. This comes just one day after a similar rally was held in Washington, D.C. Friday. The rally itself was organized by March for Our Lives, an organization started by survivors of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting in 2018. Several of the Robb Elementary victims' families joined in the rally. They called on Governor Greg Abbott to raise the age to buy an assault-style weapon. On the start of his second run for president, Donald Trump made his first campaign stop in Waco. Bryce Newberry with our sister station, KPRC, was in Waco for the rally and brings us the highlights. Tonight's rally comes amid a looming, unprecedented possible indictment against the former president over investigations of hush money payments to women who allege sexual encounters with him during his first election. But still, his supporters flock to Waco in the thousands, showing up and waiting all day long to see it. Making a Texas-sized entrance, former President Donald Trump's plane circled the air in Waco as his supporters erupted in excitement. 
the 45th president making his first stop in the 2024 race in McLennan County, where he won by more than 23 percentage points in 2020. This beautiful and incredible state. The campaign stop comes just days after he claimed he would be arrested amid an investigation of hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. I never liked horse face. I never liked the new weapon being used by out of control, unhinged Democrats to cheat on election is criminally investigating a candidate. His supporters, decked out in MAGA gear, started lining up around sunrise, unfazed by possible criminal charges. The Democrats just want Trump to go away, and they're playing this card right now. He was a great president, and I think he's going to be our next president. He's going to clean this country up, because I've got great-grandchildren that's got to grow up in it. I just kind of play by ear. I don't get too caught up in all that and see what happened. After the 90-minute speech, Trump Force One back in the skies, kicking off former President Trump's race to 2024. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick calls the controversy over choosing here to hold this rally as people mark 30 years since the deadly Waco siege unfounded, claiming he personally helped President Trump pick McLennan County for this rally. In Waco, I'm Bryce Newberry, KSAT 12 News. A West Side Chinese restaurant with a history of low health scores nearly failed its inspection. The violations they racked up and what they said when Tim Gerber dropped by this week to go behind the kitchen door. Plus, a first time American killed in a drone attack in Syria. How the U.S. plans to respond forcefully to protect its people. Welcome back. We had a beautiful Saturday and yes. we're expecting a beautiful Sunday, but there are going to be some humidity chances. So, Mia. Does the hairspray need to be handy? Oh, I would <laughs> say so, especially by Monday morning. Yeah. Okay. Tomorrow morning, humidity is still relatively on the lower end, but that is going to change throughout the day tomorrow. And then it's possible by the Monday morning drive, we actually have to deal with, yes, the extra can of hairspray, but some areas of patchy fog and maybe a little bit of drizzle as well. So yes, that's what we're going to be monitoring throughout the day tomorrow as those dew points start to rise. And then as we head into early next week. We've got some temperature changes that we'll need to talk about after a warm one out there yet again tomorrow afternoon, as well as some isolated daily rain chances. It's not going to be for everybody each and every day, but still with those chances in the forecast, probably a good idea to at least plan on keeping the umbrella in the car should some of us briefly need to use it. Not needing the umbrella out there tonight, though. In fact, it is a very comfortable feeling night across South Central Texas currently sitting at 68 degrees over at the airport, a dew point of 37. So that's that drier air that's still in place. Winds have calmed down after generally seeing some wind gusts upwards of about 25 miles per hour in spots earlier today. Tomorrow morning, still that drier air in the works, but you can see by about 4 p.m. those dew points, how we measure the low level moisture in the atmosphere already climbing into the low 60s. They're going to continue to climb as we head into Sunday night and into early Monday morning. Now, with that humidity starting to make its return, thanks to winds shifting in from the south throughout the day tomorrow, you can see by the mid to late morning hours, especially the farther south and east that you go, we might have to deal with a little bit more of that low level cloud cover filtering in from the south as well. That could hang on, especially across portions of the coastal plains, and yes, maybe even even a very isolated light shower briefly throughout the first half of the day and into the very early portions of the afternoon. And then most of that low level cloud cover looks to move farther east into Sunday afternoon. We still may find a few mid and upper level clouds, but generally I think we'll see a little bit more sunshine out there by the back half of the day tomorrow. Now let's talk temperatures. Still somewhat of a cooler morning out there yet again, waking up tomorrow in the low to mid 50s. 50s for most around 55 to 56 here in San Antonio, 55 in Canyon Lake, 55 in Pleasanton and 53 over in Hondo. We'll start to see those temperatures warm into the mid 60s by 11 a.m. Low 70s for any lunchtime plans. And then after we see some of that cloud cover break up a bit more, leading way to more peaks of sunshine into our Sunday afternoon. Temperatures do look to climb into the low to mid 80s in and around San Antonio. 
Antonio. So we've got a forecast high of about 85 here in town, 83 just up the road in Bull Verde, 86 in Rio Medina, 87 in Bandera for your Sunday afternoon. Now into Monday, those thermometers still look to climb into the low 80s, but then we see the first of two cold fronts that we have in the seven day forecast move in into Tuesday morning. That one does look to impact our temperatures a little bit more. How about daytime highs closer to about 70 degrees Tuesday and Wednesday before it can get there, though, we mentioned the potential for some patchy fog and a little bit of drizzle early Monday morning. That's certainly possible and we'll keep about a 20% potential for a few isolated showers to a stray rumble, especially up in the hill country by Monday afternoon. You can see that yes, still more temperature fluctuations throughout next week, along with those daily chances for isolated rain. So we'll continue to keep eyes on the radar over the next several days, guys. Looks good. Thanks for that, Mia. You also bet. noticed a lot of burnt orange on the graphics yeah. and graphs there. I did notice that. I noticed that as well. So I think it's time to talk happy Longhorns. And <laughs> Andrew, this is what, 15 years in the making being in the Elite Eight? It's been a while, and Rodney Terry has a lot to do with it. He's been the interim head coach for pretty much the entire season at this point. The Longhorns haven't really been tested aside from their second round game against Penn State. When we come back, we'll hear from the Horns as they prepare to take on Miami. Plus, Bravos get a rare chance at a rematch one week after last week's loss. Got that to next. I mean, for the past two years for me, since day one, you know, meeting RT, he's been nothing but an amazing coach, a guy who's pushed me to get better, and he is my head coach. No shortage of love from the Longhorns from their still interim head coach, Rodney Terry, in Big Board Sports. The Texas Longhorns are still alive in the March Madness bracket, and they're the top remaining seed left in the field heading into the Elite Eight. Texas rolled past Xavier last night in the Sweet 16, 83-71, and they did it without their best player in Dylan DeSue, who's currently listed as day-to-day -day thanks to a foot injury he suffered against Penn State in the second round. Now, that game against the Nittley Lions was really the only test Texas has faced so far. They've looked calm and collected with three rounds in the books. Why is that? I think it goes back to our age and the veterans we have on the team. There's guys in this room that have lived a lot outside of basketball and played a lot of basketball as well. And, you know, we go down against Penn State a couple points. Some teams would, you know, freeze up and the moment would be too big. But we've got big time players that are able to get the game back. And we're having a lot of fun playing with each other. We don't want it to end and we want the season to go all the way. Texas will face their toughest test of the tournament so far in number five, Miami. The Hurricanes dispatched the Midwest region's top seed Houston 98 to 75 on Friday night. All five of Miami's starters finished in double figures. This is the Hurricanes second straight trip to the Elite Eight. What do they think of the matchup against the Longhorns? They are very similar in size to us. You know, in the ACC, we've played against a lot of teams that had two seven footers in the starting lineup. This is a much different matchup for us. And uh, I, I think it should make for, for a great game. Here is the matchup. Longhorns will take on Miami tomorrow at 4.05 p.m. at the T-Mobile Center in Kansas City, Missouri. The Elite Eight got underway tonight in the East Region. Florida Atlantic's run continues with a 79-76 victory over Kansas State. The Owls didn't have a win in the tournament prior to this season. Now they're the second ninth seed ever to advance to the Final Four. And in the West Region, UConn takes down Gonzaga in dominant fashion, 82-54. The road has not been kind to our San Antonio Spurs, who have now lost three straight games, and that includes last night's setback against the Washington Wizards. Stop me if you've heard this one before. San Antonio kept it close for three quarters, but Washington pulled away in the fourth to eventually win 136-124. If there is a silver lining, it's Julian Champagny's play. His seventh game with the Spurs proved to be his best so far, finishing five for eight from the field for 12 points, three rebounds, and two blocks. Julian was uh, great again. I mean, he had some great blocks, too. Really good defender. Fun to play with. Very unselfish. I'm a role player. You know, I do my job well. Um, that's what I plan to do is just do my job well and kind of fit where I got to be fit in. You know, that's, that's, that's that. I think I shoot the ball pretty well. I don't shooting it from three today, but um, I think that's what I do. I space the floor. I'm going to knock a shot down. I'm going to play hard. Um, I'm going to give all I got. 
One more on the road trip. Next up, Spurs take on the second best team in the Eastern Conference by record, the Boston Celtics, tomorrow at 6. Our San Antonio Brahmas have a rare opportunity at some immediate revenge this weekend. One week after a tough 12-10 loss to the Renegades, the Brahmas have a rematch tomorrow, this time in Arlington. Jack Cohn will start at QB. In the last meeting, offensive coordinator Jimmy Johnson took over play calling duties, but the Brahmas were clearly hamstrung by injuries, including at the QB position. How does head coach Heinz Ward assess his OC's performance? I like some of the things we're doing offensively, you know, um, spreading the ball out, uh, opening up some running lanes. Um, you know, him and I talk, we, we do want to run the ball a little more uh, just to be able to control, um, you know, the time of possession. You can watch that game right here on KSAT 12 tomorrow. Coming up later in sports, San Antonio FC returns to the pitch in a Western Conference final rematch. Had a huge save at the end of the game. Going to be a lot of fun. Looks like a good day of sports. Horns forward. Give the Spurs a break, man. They're, <laughs> they're playing hockey. They think the game's over after the third. All right. Well, an unexpected and terrifying scene at a chocolate factory. What we know about that explosion in Pennsylvania and the ongoing search for survivors. And employees at a West Side Chinese restaurant had a hard time answering Tim Gerber's questions about their nearly failing score. That's not the first time they've been featured on Behind the Kitchen Door. A West Side Chinese restaurant with a history of low scores barely pass its most recent health inspection. Yeah, the 19th Tim Gerber tells us it's not the first time the business's poor performance has raised questions about what's going on behind their kitchen door. Beijing Express, located in the 8,000 block of Marbach Road, was all locked up when I stopped by this week. I wanted to know why they got a nearly failing score of 70 on their health inspection last month. It was the latest in a long line of low scores, all of them in the 70s. You have to go all the way back to 2019 to find one above 80. When the health inspector visited in February, she found all kinds of violations, including eight repeats from a prior inspection. A worker was seen preparing raw beef on a prep table right next to cooked pork. Another worker didn't even change their gloves or wash their hands after marinating raw beef. In fact, the inspector wrote she didn't see any hand washing by employees during the nearly two hour inspection. They were cited for the same violation in October. There was black mold-like buildup in the ice machine, also a repeat violation. Bleach and other chemicals were found stored next to buckets of soy sauce. The inspector found food storage containers of soy sauce and fresh soup being kept on the floor throughout the business. That food also uncovered. Perhaps one positive note, the inspector made no mention of any pest problems. Last October, there were numerous dead roaches found in the building and a back door was wide open. This time around, the inspector noted she found a side door left open. I had lots of questions, but with the dining area closed, there was no way inside. Oh, there's somebody right there. Hello. Some curious employees eventually came out to see what I wanted. Can I talk to you about your recent inspection? The 70? That's nearly failing. But they had no answers. Why are your scores so low? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So you don't have any comment about how low your scores are? Um, have you guys fixed all the problems that are on there? You don't know. Okay. The inspector ordered a reinspection to occur within 10 business days and told them to have all of the violations corrected. We'll let you know what they find. Nobody knows. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. Gotta love a good Tim question. So you want to know who has scores and who has good scores and who doesn't? We have a tool just for that. Scan this QR code on your screen with your phone and it'll take you to a new mapping tool. It has scores for local food businesses. The reports go back six months and are frequently updated. A new move to ban gender affirming treatments for minors. The battle is in Nebraska. Lawmakers are voting to advance a proposed bill. The bill would outlaw gender-affirming treatments for anyone younger than 19 years old. The bill would allow for civil penalties for medical providers who conduct hormone therapy, 
therapy, prescribe puberty blockers, or perform sex reassignment surgeries. Proponents say it aims to protect minors from decisions they might regret later. Those opposed say the bill is getting pushed without any input from the trans community. These bills will undoubtedly have direct and severe consequences for transgender and non-binary youth. Roughly 150 bills have been introduced in state houses nationwide targeting transgender people. Earlier this year, governors in Utah and South Dakota signed legislation banning gender affirming care into law. And in Georgia, the governor signed similar legislation Thursday. One survivor is now in the hospital after a fatal explosion at a chocolate factory in Pennsylvania. The survivor was found in the basement and officials say she was stuck in the rubble for about eight hours. The blast has reportedly claimed the lives of two people and five others are still unaccounted for. At least 10 others were injured. Investigators are still trying to figure out what happened. Meanwhile, people are still in shock about what they saw and heard. It's the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life, and it literally felt like the ground fell out from underneath you. The whole house was shaking. The lights were kind of flickering. I was really freaked out. I was thinking earthquake potentially. The factory owner releasing a statement saying in part, quote, we are sincerely grateful for the extraordinary efforts of all the first responders and for the support of our Reading community, which has been home to our business for more than 70 years, end quote. They also say they plan to continue working with officials during the recovery process. Four attacks on U.S. forces in Syria, one killing an American contractor. The U.S. responding to the first deadly attack by sending in fighter jets, destroying two Iranian-aligned facilities. NBC's Daria Albinger tells us how President Joe Biden is planning to keep an eye on the situation. More drone and rocket attacks on U.S. bases in eastern Syria, at least four in the last 48 hours. The first happening early Thursday morning at a U.S. airbase in northeast Syria. U.S. intelligence saying it was a one-way attack drone made in Iran. A U.S. contractor was killed, another injured, and five military service members were wounded. This is the first time an American has been killed in Syria in a drone attack. President Biden authorizing retaliatory airstrikes. The U.S launching two F-15s, destroying two Iranian-aligned training and equipment facilities in the region. Make no mistake, the United States does not, does not emphasize, seek conflict with Iran, but be prepared for us to act forcefully, protect our people. This is the first time the U.S. has hit targets in Syria since August. 900 American service members and hundreds more contractors are currently in Syria as part of a counter-ISIS force. Iranian-backed proxies have been behind nearly 80 rocket or drone attacks in the last two years, including three others today, one injuring a U.S. military member. Iran today is exponentially more militarily capable than it was even five years ago. And there are concerns about how the deadly drone strike got through U.S. defense systems in the first attack that killed the American contractor. We take force protection very, very seriously. Um, I will say, you know, as it pertains to radar, my understanding is uh, that there was a complete sight picture in terms of radar. All that said, uh, as is the case in any type of attack, uh, U.S. Central Command will conduct a review to assess uh, what happened. Daria Albinger, ABC News, New York. Coming up, a new exhibit celebrating Afrofuturism and pop culture is now open. How it plans to inspire the next generation.